Welcome to the Football Insomnia Camp, Paul John Dykes, and today I'm delighted to be joined by Colin Watt. Welcome to the brand new show, Colin. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic, Paul. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. Tell us about the new show. So, welcome, uh, everyone. Uh, you might remember us from such shows as A Celtic State of Mind, to use a Simpsons reference. Um, but what we are going to be discussing on these podcasts is things that kind of you ask the question about in football, things that maybe doesn't have a definitive answer, but things that you can't stop thinking about. Um, we're looking, it's going to be a weekly podcast, we're going to take a look at things that are going to be across the football and world that week, things that pique your interest, um, and we want your views as well. What's the sort of surprise football news that's out there? It doesn't have to be the obvious things. And you'll see from today's show that we're not actually talking about some of the main topics that's going on at the minute, like transfer dealings. Um, instead, today's topics we're going to be looking at are the worst football kits in the world after Manchester United released their, what has to be described as a horrible third kit. Um, Mark Miller's investment into Albion Rovers Mm. Not Albion Rovers, is it Albion Yeah, it's Albion it Rovers. Rovers. I got that you heard right. right. I'm doing not bad today. Um, and what that means um, for Scottish football. And also, are fans and people getting priced out of football? It is a, I think it's a very interesting topic when we look at not only fans going to games, but fans playing football. What can we do as a country to change that? So, Paul, where do you want to start today? I want to start off with the second subject, which is the worst football kits. I thought it was a wind-up when I seen the release of the Manchester United, which already has been called the Zebra Kit. And you know, forevermore, it's simply going to be referred to as a Manchester United Zebra Kit. Oh, definitely. It's an Adidas kit. Now, I know the excitement <laughs> of Celtic fans leading up to the Adidas launches of our three kits. Celtic fans, I think... Um, always wanted Adidas to be the manufacturers of the hoops and it finally happened and then you started seeing some dreadful designs being created for other clubs and I started getting a bit worried I must admit this is another Adidas horror show mate this is not uncommon though like horrible football kits are, are becoming a thing it's almost becoming like the more horrible it is to the human eye the more popular it becomes I mean it's like I'm trying to think back to like if you right, obviously you know a lot about kits. You've wrote a book about Celtic's history on kits. Mm. Um, so yet to be released. <laughs> we'll be discussing this in a couple of years' time as well. Um, but it was like plain. It was simple. It was just a change of colour here and there. It but was. It's, not, it's almost like a fashion statement now. I think what we've done with the the latest release of Celtic kits, for example, by Adidas, are simple. Classic designs. Definitely. Right. They've looked back through, it wasn't my book, but maybe the history books to see the designs that worked. And they've tapped into certain areas of Celtic's history and they've recreated designs and brought them right up to date. That is fail safe. That's going to work, right? And they have been universally received and acclaimed mm -hmm. by the Celtic support. What the Adidas designers have done on this occasion, and I've got to say it's Adidas designers working with the club. Yeah. If they've, they've released something that sparks online uh, interest and debate on such podcasts as the Football Insomniac, right? But it's not a good thing. It's not as though you're going to then go out and actually purchase it. Well, see, I you know, so you're getting you're yeah. getting that that you know the flurry of interest. Who's going to buy that? It's the full zebra design shorts and socks. And do you know what? It's not as if football kits are cheap these days. Like I don't know, what was your first football kit? Celtic 1986 home. Do you remember roughly how much it cost? Oh, I have no idea. No idea. But I can't but imagine. I mean, it you're costs... probably talking about 18 quid for the whole lot. Yeah. Now we're talking like the kit out, like if you want to go as in full kit, shorts, socks, shin top, guards, yeah, the whole lot. Studies. Then, go for the whole thing. Moldies. You're talking that could be best part of £200 for some of the English kits. Mm -hmm. um, it's. I, I don't really know where they've went with here when we did some research into it it was saying basically that it's a play on Manchester United's first alternative kit from when they moved into Old Trafford they'll find but a tenuous link somewhere it, was, it, it always seems to be a link what was the link with Celtic and Pink it was a bit of the Lisbon ticket mm. well the thing with that 
it got me thinking about bad kits because I did a lot of research on football kits when I was looking through the history books and images and match worn jerseys and all this kind of thing. And it sounds like an easy thing for me to say, but I don't think it's that difficult to come up with a classic kit. Um, what's happened over the years is some dreadful kits then become cult kits, don't they? Oh, they become sought after and people now try and buy not only match one kits, but replica kits. And some of the prices that people were paying for, like horrific kits from the 1980s and 90s, £150 for a replica jersey, I mean, you, £200. You take a look at the guys um, at the that have basically cornered the market. I wouldn't say cornered the market, but they're the leaders for old jerseys and replica jerseys and classic football shirts. Mm -hmm. They have a massive big warehouse. I think it's just outside Manchester, isn't it? Right. Um, with, like, it must be thousands and thousands of shirts. And it sounds like a, a day out to me um, to go down and take a look at That museum stuff. down in Manchester is impressive for oh, anybody. Really impressive. Yeah, that's very impressive. I mean, they do have tens of thousands of shirts, many of which are not on display. But... Um, Football jerseys, football um, retro is, you know, it's a, it's a thing. Mm -hmm. I remember retro when it was actually out, Colin. I remember <laughs> some of these years retro. when it wasn't <laughs> retro. So um, I like it. I do love, you know, reproductions of classic kits, classic tracksuits. I think it works. I'm all for it. But new kits coming out, one of the ones you've mentioned, Celtic using pink. I'm not averse to the use of pink. I think pink is part of a palette that needs to be considered. What annoys me when they're designing football strips is they think that, oh, let's, let's you know, engage with the female market and use pink. I mean, how outdated is that to believe that just because you wear pink, that's going to appeal yeah. to the female fan base? And it's you, outrageous. Can you imagine if you'd put it out there, boys must wear blue, girls must wear pink. It would cause an outrage in today's market. But yet still, they still do it. the biggest manufacturers trying to do it. They're still it, doing it. It makes no sense. Well, it sparks the, the actual question and everybody who's tuning in, this is a new podcast, so, you know, get involved. It's brand new. This is a pilot episode, I guess, and we're just going to run with this. Uh, we're going to do it once a week, Colin and I. Give us your suggestions for the worst football kits you've ever seen in living memory. Uh, the Manchester United Zebra kit, as we've mentioned, is up there. I'm going to say it's up there. Um, I got a message there from a good friend of mine, Jim Simonetti, who told me that a Celtic jersey in his day was a white T-shirt with green tape on it. You know, the... Makes sense, doesn't it? <laughs> Put a tape around it. There you go. There's a Celtic jersey, and he's no kidding either. So I've made a wee list here, and um, you're I've, going to have to I've use well. use your imagination. I'm going to give you my top five worst football kits. Are we going to do it? You do five, and then I do five. Or are we going to do one each and see who's compare the two? And give see me your give me your list five to one. Give me your list five to one. Oh, all right, okay. Um, I would say in at five, I have the Hearts sixteen seventeen away kit. This is the yellow and pink number. The original. Like the the original or the remake? Because uh, they redid it, didn't they? Just remember. recently. Yellow and pink, is yeah, it? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So yeah. the 16, 17 one, which just basically looks I like... I thought you meant 19, 16. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> some of us were around then, but uh, not all of us. But it basically looks like a sweetie. I quite like it. I don't know. Could you... Right. I quite like that jersey. Other than the club that, that it represents, I quite like that. It's the hoops, isn't it? Yeah. And I remember Patrick Thistle had a very, very stylish pink and grey one that was quite similar. It was a Puma jersey. Very, very difficult to get. Way. And that, that was a nice jersey as well. But can you imagine going to a pub, going to the game and wearing that <laughs> pink and yellow striped, hooped, sorry, jersey? Depends what pub it is. <laughs> I don't mind it. I'm going to be honest with you. So is that in at number that's, five that's in your chat? Five. Right. So that that's quite a reasonably recent jersey, isn't yes. it? Yeah. So Hearts are making an appearance. I do remember they had a a silver kit back in the 80s, which has become like an iconic football jersey. And at the time, it was it looked ridiculous, mm. but it's it's silver, uh, umbro. I think it was umbro. We had a maroon V-neck, and Sheffield Wednesday had a very similar strip at the time because you know a lot of clubs had the same templates they all copy each other really. yep, yeah yeah so right okay hearts aren't in my list but uh, fire away number four. Oh, we're going through mine okay mm. i would say at number four um 
I'm looking through the five here. I hadn't really numbered them. No, but I've I'm not go numbered mine. But uh, so that's why I went for. <laughs> yeah. All oh, right. Okay. Give me some time to number mine. <laughs> um, at number four, I'm going to go with Regina 2011-12 home kit. Now both the home and the away kit were styled the exact same. But basically, the best way to describe this, if you don't know the team Regina from the Italian uh, league, it is a, a red jersey, mm-hmm. kind of not too far off the, the maroon of, of hearts. But it was sculpted almost so that it looked as if the person that we- was wearing it was an Adonis. Mm. Um, so now, that a superhero kind of vibe going on, wasn't it? That's all right if you're well built, if you've got the, the physique to pull it off. But I can't imagine selling many of them in a 3, 4 or 5XL, to be perfectly honest with you. Is there not only one club in Britain that sell 5XL? Oh, probably. A club from Glasgow. <laughs> not Celtic. Anyway. That's my number four. Um, okay. It was a horrific design. What season was that? 2011-12. Right. So, I do remember it. I mean, I most of my that. kits are going to be quite recent um, mm. because of my age. Your yeah, point of reference, Colin. Yes. Um, but in at three is one probably a wee bit further back, one that quite a lot of people will know. It's the England 96 goalie kit. Mm-hmm. It was like a patchwork quilt. I do remember it. David Seaman with a ponytail. Yeah, I seem to recall. So many different colours in it. I think mm. the idea was meant to be it represented all the teams in the league or something like that. It was a colour from each team in the league. Is that right? I can't, oh, but that was a disaster of a cat. I mean, disaster of a team as well, but... Uh, it's, it's horrendous I But then England had A lot of bad goalie tops I, I think back a wee bit further And there was a zigzag affair Black and a luminous yellow mm-hmm. Was that The Euro 88 tournament Peter Shelton was, Yeah I think it was around Euro Late 80, 80s aye. That was terrible And at the time It was quite zany Because clubs Were still and, and international teams Were still getting The traditional designs From the likes of Umbro And Adidas as well And then this goalie top came out but goal, goalkeeper tops I've had some shockers I mean um, Campos used to wear the loud jerseys as well you take a look short at this, sleeves you take a look at this year's Celtic home goalie top if you're wearing it you look like a Barney the Dinosaur although that silver one's nice it's really nice with a turquoise see I, I really liked last year's mm-hmm. um, I think it was the away goalkeeper top which was a sort of black blue effort mm-hmm. with a sort of teal through it really nice Back in the day, Colin, the the goalkeeper tops were thick, thick material mm-hmm. with big pads on the, the elbows and all this kind of yeah. thing. And nobody bought them. Nobody bought goalkeeper strips, really. Very rarely did you see anybody back in the 80s buying goalie strips. Like. So obviously the clubs have looked at it as an mm-hmm. additional way of bringing revenue in. So. Definitely. So into two, and unfortunately within my top two, there is a Celtic kit. Mine too. Um, well, top five. And do you know what? I, I'm going to... Partly because it's going to annoy you. The Celtic one's going to be my number one. So in at number two is one from a team called Cultural Leonesa. Um, This is a 2014-15 away kit. Mm -hmm. They play in Spain and it was a a suit and tie, a suit and bow tie effort. Yeah, it was very dashing. Uh, I thought it was a joke when I seen it actually. They 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 wore that. They wore that. Wow, terrible. Uh, Who was the manufacturer? I know they're still in business It wasn't one of the biggies was it? No, a local th- firm maybe? I think it was based on a film They were sponsored by a film at the time Is that right? And the idea was that they were dressed up What was it? Bugsy Malone or something? It have been James Bond to try and get really? a suit like that Deary me So number one And I know this is going to irk you So I can't wait to see your response Last year's Celtic third kit Silver and pink number a pink arrow that literally pointed down to your groin area i don't know where or why anybody would have bought it um in my opinion all you looked like was as if you just came off the game show hole in the wall that used to be on bbc where they dressed you up in silver skin tight lycra and had to try and fit through holes and foam walls it was a disaster You're talking about kid. holes in walls and arrows to your groin area Colin So we'll, we'll veer away from that <laughs> um, It was a, actually a pink chevron It was a pink chevron And it was harking back to an old Celtic jersey from back in the day That was like a, an old Adrianian's top That was green with a white chevron That was the tenuous link It is the only Celtic jersey to be released and never worn Is there a reason for that? Well, the, the season was cut short 
And I don't think the club would have allowed that to happen um, had the, the season been completed because it is... I think there's a contractual There's thing probably a contractual point. obligation to wear the jersey at least once. It was never worn. It was a very difficult jersey for me to get my hold, my hands on because I was looking for match-worn jerseys and I had to obviously get a match-prepared jersey for that particular one. Is it as bad as you suggest? Is it the worst football kit of all time? It's no worse than that um, one with the shirt and tie or any of that kind of stuff. It's nowhere near that. I don't, put it this way. I could see collectors picking up the Regina kit. I can see them picking up the bow tie kit. I can see them picking up the England 96 kit, as bad as they were, but I could never see anyone picking up that Celtic 20, right. 19, Let me make a prediction, right? See, in 10 years' time, that will be going, that will be changing hands on eBay for big money. It's going to be a hard-to-get jersey. I was, I've got a wee bit of information about the lack of sales uh, of that jersey from Celtic and they had a storeroom full of them. Mm -hmm. They'll be getting given away for a bit of fiver at the moment, but they will become sought after. I, I can guarantee you they'll, it'll be one of the kits that you see that's donated to countries around the world as part of Celtic's good fund. Good. And I'd love to see them wearing them all over in Malawi and such places. So let's see your top five. Then, well, my, my top five. Uh, number five, and again, no favouritism whatsoever, it's a Celtic jersey. It's an Umbro jersey, and it was from the season where Liam Brady took over as a Celtic manager. And we were sponsored by People's Fort, who are a relatively small company mm -hmm. who operated out of various places in Scotland, one being Glasgow. And it was the away jersey, which was nothing short of a monstrosity. It's got to be said. It's terrible. I like it. For anybody who's not a Celtic fan, um, or for any Celtic fans who need reminded because they've removed it from their, their memory banks, it was so bad. It was like a zigzag effect. It was like the finances of Glasgow Rangers. It just it was a zigzag that kept going down. <laughs> On the top end, it was like 40 shades of green stroke brown. On the bottom was a lovely shade of lime green and then in the middle was white. The sponsor was red, white and blue. Horrific. It was the worst years ever. I had the replica, I've got to admit, because I was loyal to my club. I had the replica and it was one of those furry badges that was like a bit of cartilage, in fact, a bit of sandpaper on the back, back of it. So it wasn't good for the left nip. But um, <laughs> that is in there at number five. Terrible jersey, but it's become a cult iconic yeah. jersey. You try and buy a replica of that, £150, £200, that's how much it'll cost. Match worn ones with the long sleeves, doesn't make it look any better, <laughs> but it is a terrible jersey. And what's your number four? I'm going to tell you that, but see when I think of that jersey, I'm not finished with it yet. When I think <laughs> of that Celtic jersey, I think, of, Celtic, I think of Tony Cascarino in a Celtic shirt. That is who that reminds me of. So it's not good memories, not good memories. And I know he went away and started scoring goals for Marseille in the second tier of the French league, but... Bad times for Celtic, bad, bad jerseys for Celtic. <laughs> now, that was Umbro. Number four in my list is another Umbro strip. You might not remember this, but Ajax away. Um, it was red, white and blue, and I've got nothing against that colour scheme. 1989. They wore it at Celtic Park. This isn't a Celtic podcast, but this is my point of reference. They wore it at Celtic Park in what became Tommy Burns' final game for Celtic. And it was terrible. It was like rectangles and squares were a wee bit triangles zigzag it was I don't know what was going on on Umbro Towers around about the late 80s and early 90s but these designs were absolutely dreadful <laughs> you wouldn't you wouldn't have used it for a bed sheet or a set of curtains it was that bad <laughs> number three a little known manufacturer called Loki, L-O-K-I yeah. started making football jerseys in the 1990s and around about the time of Ivan or Ivan Golak, remember him? Livingston. He was uh, manager of Dundee United. Oh, he had previously been Partizan Belgrade's manager and he came along and he actually won Dundee United the Scottish Cup. If you go back, I think it was 1994, they won the Scottish it's Cup. Uh, no, it was one later. They beat Rangers 1-0 in the oh, final. Okay. Craig, Craig Brewster scored the goal. I think Ali Maxwell got blamed for it. Uh, the Motherwell uh, won, was, Motherwell won the Scottish Cup. So they did. But uh, Craig Bristol scored the goal. And their home jersey wasn't, wasn't the best because at that time, there was a great Adidas design where they had the three stripes on the shoulders. So they had either the three stripes on one shoulder, 
as supported by Marseille and Liverpool, mm -hmm. or they had the three uh, stripes on both shoulders as supported by the likes of France, mm -hmm. and also Glasgow Rangers wore their jersey. Uh, they were nice jerseys. Loki tried to rip it off with two stripes, and it was as embarrassing as getting Adidas two-stripe trainers when you were a kid, <laughs> right? Like the fakey jakeys, right? So Loki came out with a 1993 Dundee United away strip that I can only describe as a Jackson Pollock design. It was like a white shirt that somebody had chucked black paint at. It's terrible. But again, you find one of them on eBay and you're paying several hundred quid for it. Terrible jersey. And that made it into my number three position. So two spaces left. Who have we got? Number two, right? We go back to one of these templates that Umbro had uh, back in the 1990s. And various clubs had the same template. Manchester United, Nottingham Forest and Celtic. But the worst version of this jersey was Chelsea away. Grey and orange with the Coors oh. sponsor. It was, honestly, it was so bad. It was worn by players like Ruth Hullett who could look stylish in just about anything. But he put them in that jersey and he looked like a bag of shit. It's actually just reminded me a bit like, do you remember um, Manchester City's away kit last season? The one that sort of went colour scheme right through. It changed colour. Yep. It was like purple into orange into, mm. oh... But the thing about football kits for me is they have to be at a point where you feel comfortable walking out the house with them on. And some of these kits, I would be ashamed to even put them over my head. I wouldn't wear them on my own in my house under a dressing gown. To I would be judge myself looking in the mirror. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but the worst I've ever seen, the worst I've ever seen, Admiral, 1978, Coventry City, brown and white. It is a monstrosity. It is terrible. It's so bad. It's so bad it's not even good. You know how sometimes <laughs> things are so bad that they become good? This isn't one of them. It is notoriously bad. But again, try and buy one of them and you're paying hundreds and hundreds of pounds. And that's the argument I've got with the Celtic one you mentioned. I think that's going to be a cult jersey. Now let's have a look at some of the comments coming in because uh, the 10 jerseys mentioned are merely our opinion. Boy. So let's have a look at some of them. Celtic Rab, uh, welcome to the show, Celtic Rab, great to hear from you, and you agree with me, the Celtic mountaintop in the early 90s, he calls it mountaintop, I call it uh, Rangers Audit. So the mountaintop to me, <laughs> it's almost like a reverse of the prices, right? Where the wee guy goes up the mountain, I take it that's what he's referencing. A bit like that, yep, uh, right, yep. Gordon Wilson says, good afternoon guys, and an afternoon to you as well, thanks for joining us on YouTube, we're going out on a state of mind YouTube, so please uh, subscribe to us there, we're, we're going to be producing loads and loads of content on various different subjects, this is a general football chat, where we talk about things that may not be um, you know, the most obvious subjects, and we're talking about the worst football jerseys uh, in living memory, and that's on the back of Man United's Zebra kit, which, you know, Stan Collingwood tweeted about it and I thought it was a wind up some of these guys on Photoshop and various other programs are tremendous at oh, creating. I thought it was just somebody taking the uh, the Mickey. I think even when as Celtic fans, when we were looking forward to Adidas coming through, there were so many kits that were kind of created on Photoshop or all these different programs online, and you looked at them and they went, "That's fantastic." It some even of them got are to the point where newspapers were running with them, saying, I know. "Is this the new home kit? Is this mm. the new away kit?" Well, it does beg the question. I think someone asks the question about fan engagement or even club engagement mm -hmm. when you look at some of these jerseys. So we'll speak about that as well. Uh, Celtic Rab goes on to say, remember the wee Umbro box sets? I do. Colin's too young yeah. to remember them. But you used to get them in wee boxes. It was brilliant. You see-through bit. And again, some people out there, some forward-thinking people out there have kept the jerseys intact. But worth more than the box. Worth, worth an absolute mint. Now, here's a suggestion. Uh, the Gal, 1980. Great shout from the Gal. What about the Linfield tribute? Yeah. Is this the, the most recent one we're talking about? It is. I mean, to be honest with you, I didn't put it in the list. If we were talking about the worst taste um, of kit, then that, that's got to be it. That was done in bad taste. I find it funny, though, that there's quite a few of your kits, and probably some of these ones as well. I think the England one especially was Umbro. Mm, a lot of the Umbro, I know, I know. Some of and the Umbro that, jerseys that were Linfield dreadful. That kit was Umbro as well. It was Umbro. Didn't they try and distance themselves they from... Did. They said they wouldn't sell it themselves. Yeah, yeah. But and quite I, I mean, so. see the thing about these kits, when we talk about terrible kits or we talk about kits like that, they get publicity, and with publicity comes sales. 
Well, the zebra kit has got a lot of publicity. Would I buy it? No chance. No, but people will. You think? No, but I guarantee. Are they going for like a, a zany market somewhere else on the planet? You know what I mean? Are they doing their market research? And the reason I'm asking, there's a good que- there's a good reason behind this, uh, because the gal goes on to ask how big an influence the clubs have on these horrendous kits, and it's a great question. I've often wondered it myself. You get these fan engagement focus groups Mm -hmm. and they talk about all these different templates, colours. What would a Celtic fan buy in the UK? What would they buy in the US, etc, etc. And they consider everything. So there was actually a suggestion at one of these Celtic events where New Balance seriously pitched the idea of Celtic at some point having a blue kit. Mm -hmm. Now you've said there there's been some goalkeeper strips that are veering on the the edge of that. But they were talking about the fact that you know, there was some statistic where a pocket of Celtic fans were based in America and they'd done their market research on sports kits or jerseys in that area. Biggest sellers were blue. Therefore, they married the two things up together and it was a two plus two equals five affair. So they went away with their tail between the legs, but they considered releasing a blue Celtic strip. See, in America, sports are different. Like, I would never think of wearing a Rangers kit as a Celtic fan. Even, it would need to be one of those charity bets where you've got to put it on for whatever, right? But in America, they they kind of frequently wear other teams' jerseys. And a lot of the kind of... Why would you do that? The colour schemes that go across American sports are red, white and blue Mm. to tie in with the American flag. So if they're talking about an American company doing American research, then blue doesn't really surprise me. Kevin Graham coming in with some comments in relation to our uh, dilemma around the Manu kit. It's a dilemma because if I was a parent and my kid wanted that, I'd need to say no. And Kevin <laughs> says it's the third kit. It's the third kit yep. that will be worn a handful of times. Well, it's a total cash in if it's a third kit. How many clubs need a third kit? It's bad planning, right? It's for the kids. It will be a cult kit. I don't know if it will be a cult kit. I don't know. Uh, it will be one of these ones that tops lists forever more of the worst jerseys. It will certainly not be an iconic kit. What I need to know is, is there a new Madagascar film coming out? Because I think the, the zebra and that would be the good promotion for Man United if that was the case. But we're talking about um, third kits. Borussia Dortmund last season had five kits. Two home, two away and a third. How does that work? One, how, how can you have two home jerseys? They had a home jersey. A home European jersey, an away jersey, an away European jersey, and a third kit. I'm not accepting five kits. that. I'm not accepting that. In fact, it may have been more, but I can only remember the five. But, but listen, Colin, we've just a minute ago said about Celtic. For example, Celtic, three kits plus two goal, goalie jerseys. Now, not that long ago, goalie jerseys weren't really things that people bought. You had the odd goalkeeper, right, who would buy the full Scotland goalkeeper strip or, or uh, full Celtic one. I can never remember seeing many of them around though. Now it's a thing whereby it's a fashionable, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, thing to go and buy. So the one you mentioned, which would, I guess, be the away goalkeeper strip, which is a silver with the turquoise um, trims, short sleeves. It's a nice jersey. But that's, that's the fifth top that's available to buy. The purple one's the home goalie strip plus the three. So we're doing it. We're just marketing it differently. We're not calling it a home European or an away mm. European, but we're actually selling fans five different jerseys. And that's every season. And the thing is, it's like, but when a new kit comes out, what do you see advertised? When you look at the posters for mm-hmm. kits coming out, mm-hmm. especially I've noticed that this year with Celtic, it is just the kit. It is the green and white hoops. Mm-hmm. It was the black with the green, um, and it was the green away. You never seen the goalkeeper kit. I do remember Craig Gordon a few times being in the the promo shots and for New Balance, yeah, eh? but for Adidas yeah. this year they definitely they didn't. No. So the the first time we actually seen the monstrosity of the the purple Barney kit was when we played our first game and it appeared on the screens. I'm sure Fraser Foster called it the Barney kit, did he not? That's, that's probably why he never signed. Yeah, well, <laughs> Kevin Graham again uh, suggests the Man City away strip from last season, which you've already that mentioned. And Stephen Henderson via YouTube, I remember the pink and grey Partick kit, that was smashing it, was a thing of beauty. The, the Partick, can you remember that one? It, it was hoops. I, th- I think I do remember it, but I, I mean, I guess it kind of ties in with that kind of club. Do you know what I mean? Like It's a sort of hipster 
top. It's always been club. that kind of hipsters, you know, yeah. the choice of the student, exactly. the, the choice of the intellectual. Um, now, Gordon Wilson, the Scottish team, had a horrendous pink top, not for us. I'm not averse to the use of pink, but I agree with Gordon on this occasion. That was not a I good use, top, a good use but of the colour. But then they did bring out, <laughs> and I'm going against what I put in here, a pink and yellow number as well. But it wasn't just pink and yellow hoops. It was white with pink and yellow stripes through it. Mm. And that was actually quite a good I remember that. I remember that now that you mention it. Yeah, yeah I do remember that. Celtic Rab reminds us of a, a, a manufacturer called Castori. <laughs> Enough said. <laughs> Enough good said, boy. okay. What's the next topic? And Stephen Henderson speaks about uh, Celtic's vertical black and green stripes as worn by Nakamura. I think that's a classic. I like that. I thought it was a classic. That reminds me of going to Old Trafford. Champions League nights. Yeah. Um, quite a simple design. I mean, there was no frills. It was just vertical stripes. Yeah. A nice collar. Looked good with the long sleeves. I think Nike. Who do you think of, apart from Nakamura wearing that jersey? Go to do you? Yeah. Tommy Gravison. <laughs> <laughs> Celtic <laughs> boy. We're getting a lot of Celtic fans in here, so that's great to see because Colin and I uh, support Celtic and that's no problem but this is a podcast for everybody so throw in your suggestions no matter what club it is uh, Hoops 2004 was my favourite uh, love when we wear normal strips I that, think is that the one that Lawrence was wearing yesterday? that was uh, 2003 wasn't it? was that not the Seville era? Not sure. although I know that in Seville we didn't wear uh, that sponsor yeah. um, Agent Bolly Bombscare who could he be talking about? <laughs> yes, the pink Scotland kit was a horror. Scottish warriors in bright pink. Someone at Adidas was taking the mickey. You sometimes wonder, now Joseph Byrne, love the bumblebee, always see Larson when I see it. Yep. Again, you know, in terms of the fact that you look at the actual design of that, the original bumblebee, because obviously we, uh, we went back to that when we were with Nike. We being Celtic, went back to that when we were with Nike. The original Bumblebee was a bit garish, to be honest with you. When you actually look back at it. It was one of my first ever kits. Was it? was the original Bumblebee. I'm not slagging but, it. I know how, how uh, iconic it's become. It was my Rangers supporting uncle that actually bought me it. It probably hurt him. As punishment. It, but <laughs> but it, the fact that we've tried to replicate it many times shows how iconic it actually became. Um, and I'm pretty sure down the line when we're desperate to try and pull out a new design, we'll probably go back to it. Stephen uh, Henderson commented again on YouTube, did you mention the horrible Barcelona orange to yellow gradient 12-13 kit? That is another horror show, isn't it? I had that. Did you? I had that kit. Oh, could you wear it for the next time we do this? Just <laughs> to remind <laughs> us how bad it is. <laughs> and Joseph Byrne on YouTube, have to say Celtic's home kit this year is like a ceremonial uniform. Look good picking up all the trophies this season. Well, we are playing for five trophies this season, Colin. Um, how many do you think Celtic will win? You've asked me this before. Mm. I'm, I'm going with three. I'm still staying with three. All from this season or one from last? One from last. All right, so a double this season. Double this season. Oh, we shall see. And Meek reminds us that there's actually three goalkeeper kits at Celtic this season. Yeah. That's horrendous. Are yeah, there? What's yeah. the third one? It's a sort of lime green effort. Again, it's... Six jerseys that you can go and buy. Six kits you can go and buy. Yes. And then Joseph uh, follows it up to remind us that we've only got two goalkeepers, three jerseys, two goalies. Uh, Celtic Rab is good seeing Celtic women getting involved in the launch now yeah it is and we would love to see more females on or uh, host the podcasts that reminds me do you remember the Manchester United kit from a couple of years ago when they released a female version no they released a female version of the, the home kit mm -hmm. and I had to get pulled a week later why because this, the men's home kit was round neck right the women's home kit was V neck Right. To show off their cleavage. And without any real surprise, it was pulled after... Why, why would it be pulled? They claimed it was sexist. Well, you know... I can understand that. Is it not a fashionable um, choice uh, for females to wear that? I mean, I wouldn't like to show off my regions around that area or whatever I'm wearing around my neck, but some women might want to wear a phoenix. neck. they What's... never had the choice, did they? It was always, it was either you, you wore a men's fit or the female fit. But, but why became, pull it? Why not just bring it a, a round neck? They did. Right. But they pulled. They pulled the, the v neck? Yeah. A bad choice, I think. Tell you what, that might be one that goes for a lot of money. 
I'm sure it will. Yeah, if it's been pulled, without a doubt. Um, and from Facebook, I love the Scotland salmon strip. Not, you know, it was not for all. Can you remember the salmon strip? That sort of late nineties. Well, there was actually two that used salmon in, in the design. One of them was worn by Duncan Ferguson when he um, an acrobatic effort against Germany, and everybody thinks he hit the bar. He didn't hit the bar; it was a safe. But the ball came over and he overhead kick, and he was wearing a salmon strip. I vaguely remember guys like Colin Cameron wearing a kit like that. That might have been the one that had the blue on it as well. There's been a couple of salmon mm. kits, uh, definitely. And also we've got meat coming back. I remember a few seasons back, the pink polo shirt kit. Someone photoshopped a pic of it to make it dark green and it was lovely. A few seasons later, we got that exact green polo shirt. Um, I think that does happen from time to time. Celtic ran a competition uh, in the Celtic View for, you know, back in the 70s for fans to actually design the Celtic away strip. And the one that won was from a fan called Gordon Cowens and the strip became Celtic's away jersey. So sometimes they do listen to fans. I've seen that, especially at my local club at Morton. Over the last few seasons, they've run competitions to design their kits, um, their away kit. Mm -hmm. And there's been some interesting choices um, amongst them. Um, but it just shows that why not reach out to the fan? Because at the end of the day, it's the fan that's going to be buying the kit. Absolutely. Especially in this day and age when it's easy to do so. I mean, exactly. the, the example I'm using goes back to a time where Celtic communicated to their fans via a match programme and the Celtic view. So you it know, was Club Call still there? It might not even have started actually Club oh, Call. I think that came a wee bit later. But I do remember that. And, and you know, people would need to write letters and write, draw pictures and send them in. But now it's so easy to communicate and engage with fans. So mm -hmm. why not have that, even if it is a, a virtual engagement uh, pool or group where you can get people's yeah. views on things like that, Colin? Because it is important. It's a massive part of the merchandise of any football club, but particularly when, when Celtic don't have the broadcasting deals of some of the larger clubs down south. I say larger, I mean larger in terms of finance. Um, and we rely on big merchandise Definitely. sales. When you, when you look at the accounts for in recent seasons, things like merchandise can take up to 20% of your turnover. So it's, it's massive. This might creep into a future podcast, Colin, I'm sure it will, but um, we've had uh, Agent Bolly Bombscare coming back to say the nicest he's seen is the Brazil 1982 strip. I'm going to ask you a simple question. The, the most classic football kit of all time. It's like that. I would be, yeah. I think I'd have to agree with with Bolly. All right. The Brazil kit is such an iconic kit. It, it's almost like you look at a color and you see Brazil. So you look at the yellow with this sort of tinge of blue through it. Couldn't be away. No, they're the blue Brazil. Um, but it is. But the Brazilian kit is just. Synonymous, it's the same almost with the Argentinian um, sort of baby blue and white. Mm. Celtic's green and white. Mm -hmm. um, there's there's a, iconic kits like that. The Lisbon kit, if you look at a club kit, is probably one of the most iconic kits globally. But when you look at a, a jersey across the world, that yellow Brazil, um, it's just... When you think of some of the players that's played there as well, like Pele and Ronaldinho, Romario... Rafael... <laughs> Joseph Byrne, Argentina kit winner. Um, Argentina, what jersey am I thinking? I'm probably thinking 82, 86, some classic Argentina jerseys. Um, maybe I've got good memories because the bold Diego Armando Maradona was wearing them. Yep. And um, against England, of course. We might have some England fans tuning in, so be careful. Agent Bolly Bombscare, I love the Soviet Union strip from 88 Euros. I think it was white with red CCCP on the front. But th have a look at all the kits from that tournament. There were some classic kits mm. from the 88 Euros, like proper iconic jerseys. I mean, the, the Netherlands, the classic Netherlands the jersey. jersey. Oh, yeah. it was beautiful. Well, normally they do wear orange, but this was the, the one with that zigzag affair that oh, also be, yeah. was used by West Germany. Yep. Uh, they had the green away kit, same design, same template. And... Uh, the Denmark kit from the same time. I'm thinking back to Hummel 1986 World I'm Cup. 92 Euros with the red Hummel. Mm -hmm. Lovely kit. They, they had that. I think they've reintroduced it. They had the, the very thin pinstripes mm -hmm. and it was like 
one tone on that side, one tone on that side. They had Coventry City wearing it and Denmark's national team winning it and various other teams. It was a classic. Sweden, 94, World Cup kit. Is that the Adidas one? Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Kit. As won by Henrik Larsson. Some brilliant jersey. We started off with the bad and we're now talking about the good. And there's plenty of others. There's plenty of others. Now, another thing that piqued my interest this week, and Peak, was that not Peaky? Was he not the mascot of the Mexico 86 World Cup? I don't know. I thought you were going to go into your Peaky Blinders discussion. No, I'm still engulfed by that. I'm going to watch a few episodes tonight. If anybody's a Peaky Blinders fan, feel free to get involved in the conversation on that. Might do a full podcast on it, actually. Um, you're not a fan. I've not seen it. I've generally not seen it. Ah, you're in for a treat if you ever get round to it because it was one of the ones where I knew I would like it. I knew I knew I would like it. It's like people who recommend certain music to you and you know that if they're going to... They only recommend it because they know you're going to like a certain yeah. band or album, right? And they get to know your taste. People that I trust their taste were telling me that I would love Peaky Blinders. And it wasn't that I relented. I just didn't have time. I'd had a few things, books and all sorts and films and all that kind of stuff and setting up studios. I didn't have time. And I know it launched in 2013, so it was on my to-do list for seven years, but that happens with me, Colin. So anybody out there who hasn't received an email back from me, I'm not ignoring you. I get round to it. I definitely <laughs> get, later, don't I do get round to it, right? So the Peaky Blinders was on my list. I finally got round to it and I am hooked. I'm on series four and I'm, I'm, I'm slowing down when I watch it because I want it to last that wee bit longer because I know I'm coming up to the last episode, you know? See, I think you should just keep up with the pace because if you've got seven years worth of television to catch up on, I would try and get through it as quick as possible. But Nicholas McDade comes on and says, Peaky, pesky blinders, it's pish. I disagree. It's brilliant. I can't say. I'm I love it. it. I love everything about it. So what else has piqued your interest this week? What's piqued my interest is, um, what's piqued my interest is Mark Miller. Mark Miller, mm -hmm. um, you may be aware, Mark Miller is an absolutely, he's a legend in the world of comic books, and not just comic books, but graphic novels. And he's Marvel, isn't he? All that, yeah, I mean, the guy's brilliant. He, he's an absolute master at his craft. And I followed him ever since a friend of mine that I used to work with gave me a loan, a couple of uh, things that he had, that he had uh, written. Because he's obviously, he's not the artist, he's the writer of, mm. of these things. And he gave me Wanted, which I really, really liked. And he gave me some of the films, um, things like uh, Kingsman. And I enjoyed mm -hmm. that as well. And so I was already interested. And what made me even more interested was when I realised that he had written into a Wolverine storyline that Wolverine was going to be wearing the green and white hoops. And the villain of the show uh, wore a, a blue NTL jersey. And when he was getting buried, there was a ranger scarf on the coffin. I just thought, brilliant, subliminal. Half the world won't notice this, but it was there. It's like Wolverine the, in the green and white hoops. It's like those things you see in like random Simpsons episodes Aye. where a Celtic badge appears. Aye, exactly. I'm looking for some kind of sign in Peaky Blinders. I've not seen it, or Pesky Blinders. I've not seen it yet. So, Matt Miller, we all know him. He's a Coke Bridge guy. He's a, he's a Celtic fan. He's actually a Celtic fan. I remember there was a photo on James... McInerney's Twitter. We know James from uh, Bend It Like Bratback, which mm -hmm. is an outstanding stage show uh, from a friend um, called Jim Orr. He, he wrote that show. And James McInerney is a friend of Mark Miller. So they were at the Celtic game together. And it was refreshing, although Wolverine had already let the cat out of the bag, that Mark Miller was a Celtic fan. But he's a, he's a Coke Bridge native. Mm -hmm. So he's obviously, he's got a soft spot for Albion Rovers. And there's a brilliant story this week that he has invested in a club um, and installing streaming cameras mm -hmm. at the stadium, Cliftonville, a famous Scottish stadium. It, it's cost 18 grand, but what they're looking at is they're looking at 22 lower league Scottish clubs have signed up um, to allow their games to be streamed globally, live. I think it's brilliant. It's superb that he's got involved um, because what happens if he puts his name to it is it gets a lot of publicity, but he's yeah. also uh, invested. And... Personally, I think it's fantastic. So I'm going to put it out to you. We, we haven't discussed this, but we've got Mark Miller as Albion Rovers. Mm. If these lower league clubs needed an ambassador with local celebrities, who could you tie in? And I'll ask that to the listeners as well. I'm thinking Paolo Nettini could come in under St Mirren. Um, Celtic fan. Yeah, but... Still, local club. Mm -hmm. Gordon Brown, Rafe Rovers. Yeah. So, 
the listeners and the viewers that are out there, who would be the local hero in the sense that Mark Miller is superhero and a local hero? No, you're right, because he, he spoke about being nervous at the future of Albion Rovers. It was his local club. Um, had always been there. We're going to the pandemic. He started con- being concerned at the future of the club. And he thought, well, we've got to do something to get the money through the gate. So I think there is the, the, the way this is going to work, they're going to trial it in a gate, an upcoming match. Um, and the first league game, I believe, is against Denny Schmuir. In October, is it? And they're going to make it uh, available so that wherever you are in the world, you can buy it. You can watch the game. You can stream it live. And, and it's going to generate revenue because there's going to be no fans in, in the stadium. I, I wouldn't have thought at that point. Uh, and obviously it, it's something that's piqued um, my interest and it will pique the interest of others, right? Because of who Mark Miller is. Mm-hmm. And I think that's great. He's built up his reputation elsewhere in his world and he's a, a total master at his craft. But he, the 18 grand thing's great, but that's not the big part of this. The big part of it is him putting his name to that as well yeah no definitely and I mean you've got to look at the way news travels these days where did you actually see that information did someone tell you that or did you see it online that was social media yeah yep. so when you look at the following someone like Mark Miller would have mm-hmm. if you can get guys like that attracted to Scottish football it gets the word out there yeah and you don't know where his followers are coming from they'll be from all over the world you know what I like about it as well Colin no, you're right, he's got a fan base, worldwide fan base. What I like about it, it's not some guy with loads of money chucking a big bag of money at a football club. We've seen that so many times. Mm-hmm. It's somebody who's thinking um, left field. How can they do something that's sustainable, that the club can use forevermore, that, that's a bit, you know, new? It's, it, we are speaking about it just now. Would we otherwise have been speaking about Albion Rovers? Probably not. No. Now, <laughs> the, what, I, what comes to my head just as we speak about that is, didn't Wet 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 sponsor, was it Clyde Banks? We did. Kit? Yeah, we did, aye. So, I but mean, there's been a few occasions where, where bands have sponsored jerseys. Mogwai sponsored St. Rock's Primary School, I think it was a primary school, um, football team. And the jerseys were, you know, I wanted to buy one. It had Mogwai's logo on it. Uh-huh. There's been a few other examples. Ian Brown sponsored a local, I think it was a Sunday, a Sunday League team. Ian Brown. Would you, the, <laughs> one of the guys at One Direction that signed for Doncaster Rovers mm-hmm. paid to actually sign for them because the money that he invested actually went into the youth development system. Great. He, super for the animals, Cardiff City. And again, the jerseys then become sought after because it's got Super for the Animals logo on it. So, I think Skint or Fatboy Slim sponsored Brighton at one point. Maybe just for a game or for a season. Yeah. So there's all these wee things you can do. I always thought about that actually when uh, Dunfermline Athletic were in financial disarray and had they released a classic kit with something like The Skids on it, because that's a local band, yep. The Skids, Into the Valley, the, the song gets played at East End Park. Um, then, you know, The Skids could be selling that at, at gigs. Mm. You know, they, they could tour the world and they could be selling Dunfermline jerseys. It, it's a crossover that works. But it, this is one of the best crossovers I've ever read about. I think it's brilliant what Matt Miller's done. Definitely. Uh, I think what I'll probably do is I'll probably get in about that and buy a few games and just support it. I think it's a great initiative. I think there'll be plenty of people like yourself out there mm-hmm. that'll do it. All we, do you know what? All you can do is try. If we don't try new things, we won't know whether they work or they don't. And see, at the end of the day, there's probably going to be no cost to Albion Rovers for this to happen Mark Miller's went and put the investment in himself and if it works great for the club if mm-hmm. not they'll go back to the drawing board and they'll try something else well we asked the question the other day and it wasn't as a result of this I think this news broke a couple of days ago um, but we were talking about and I asked uh, Kevin and I've asked yourself would you buy a St Pauli virtual season ticket here's a German club who've spent most of their uh, their, their their time, their history outside of the top division. They've become a cult, iconic club. We know the story. Um, I got immersed in all that. I went over to Germany to uh, go to you know the Jolly Roger, and, yep. and um, I got friendly with a couple of the fans over there. And the answer is yeah, I would. If you know, I'd, I'd pay fifty quid every single year to have a virtual season ticket for a German second division club. Right now, now that I've read this, whatever the season ticket, if you can buy that, I don't know if it's an option yet for the virtual Albion Rovers uh, gig, I'll buy that. 
you know, I, I think I, great. I'd, I'd like to support it. I can't remember if it's Albion Rovers or Stirling Albion. I always get confused between the two. Because um, they're in different cities and they wear different colours. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you'd said Melchester Rovers and Albion Rovers, maybe, but. Well, what I like about Albion Rovers, they're, they're one of these clubs that've just, like, you know, they've used, like, United and, and Rovers. It's just Albion and Rovers. There's no real, like, pre name. They've used two sub names. To go back to the point I was trying to. You know what I mean? <laughs> after you went off in a diversion. Ta- it's tangent. true, though. Albion, is there any other clubs in the world that just use the two subtexts and just chuck them together? Rovers United. Albion Rovers. Huh. Did you even think about that? No. No. I mean, Can you decide? Guess, is it Albion? This is, is it the Rovers? kind of things that keep you up at night, and that's why this is the Football Insomniac podcast. Well, let me tell you. Um, so, I think it was still in Albion um, who released season tickets mm, for ten pounds, right? But it wasn't for fans going into the games. Mm-hmm. It, it may have been more than ten pounds, but guys like Vincent Company bought season tickets. There you go for the club because it was part of a fundraiser to keep mm-hmm. them going. Mm-hmm. So there will be people out there like yourself that says if St Pauli needed a virtual season ticket of £50, you would pay it? I would do that because of the cult uh, connection to Celtic fans, you know, because we, we've got a shared ideology and political mindset. Mm. Uh, and as long as that's there, I'll have an interest in St Pauli. And I think it'll always be there. Um, but if a club closer to home, like Albion Rovers, with their two kind of sub-names, uh, you know, what would they be called? Coat Bridge Rovers or Coat Bridge Albion? They couldn't, they couldn't decide, so they just called it Albion Rovers. Um, if that's available, I'll buy it. Hundred yeah. percent, I'll buy it. So let's go back to some more of the comments because you're obviously very dismissive of the comments <laughs> I'm making. Um, Agent Bolly Bombskier is saying I haven't watched anything since Breaking Bad. Now that is on my list. You that made Breaking it. Bad. This guy's never seen Breaking. But guy or girl has never seen Breaking Bad. You, but have you? Seen no, Breaking no, it's Bad? on my list. I've never seen a single <sighs> second of it. Honestly, one of the best TV series. It's on the of list, all mate. Time. The finale is one of the best endings to a TV show I've ever seen. How many series has it got? I think it's eight. Oh, well, you know, I'll work my way through it, mate, now that I get uh, one night off a week. Uh, <laughs> Nicholas McDade, Nothing Beats Sopranos. I'm going to make an admission right here. It's on the list. I've never seen it. Never seen it. I will, I will watch it. I know. Ah, but mate, we're at this kind of we're at this point of development <laughs> and technological advancement that you can you can watch these things. Okay. Um, it's on my list, and I will watch it from start to finish. We then have Jed Sweeney reminding us about the Manu Invisible Strip. Can you remember what he's talking about? No. Right. Remember the Chelsea one I mentioned? Man United had a version of that, and mm-hmm. it was grey. Right. And Ferguson, uh, Man United. Correct me if I'm wrong, Jed, and everybody else watching. Man United were playing Southampton at the Dell. And this was at the time of Letizia and um, etc. Mid to late 90s. It was in the 90s, I certainly. Red stripes, grey, sharp. Yeah, aye, it yeah, was a yeah, sharp yeah. view cam with the grey. And Fergie claimed that they were so bad in the first half because they, took it off. Aye, uh-huh. they couldn't spot the players because the players were blending into the background like they were chameleons. I do remember that. Um, they changed into a white and blue kit, if I remember uh, right. They won in the second half. Yeah, so another one. Um, Joseph Byrne talking about Marty Pello but we'll just leave that one there <laughs> Kevin Graham Albion Rovers are a cult Scottish club Irvin Welsh was involved in the book called The Children of Albion Rovers can you remember Kevin without checking because you're probably at home working from home the story that he wrote about I'm sure it was some kind of alien invasion story that Irvin Welsh wrote about and it had been in alien a fanzine it had been in a fanzine and, and it was reproduced in The Children of Albion Rovers. The cover was really cool. They were all done up like old Panini stickers. Mm. We are in Albion Rovers jerseys. Um, and elsewhere, we have Kevin Graham. Things that have interested me this week, Melchester Rovers have bid for Morelos. Well, you know, it's as I mean, believable as any other club, We to are going fair. through the A to Z of teams that are bidding for him. I see today's, it's laughable. Today it's Inter Milan. So no if we can think of anyone apart from Juventus that start with a Jai, then... No chance. Throw your bids in from next week? No chance. Breaking Bad is great, says Celtic Rab. Well, as I say, it is on this list and I'll, I'll work my way through it. Um, and Agent Bolly Bombscare, I will love Breaking Bad. I've been told that a few times. I think I will enjoy it. And uh, Football CFB, worst Celtic kit of your lifetime. I've got to say it's the Umbro 1991 Celtic away, the zigzag affair. Terrible red, white, and blue sponsor, the worst ever. Yeah, Callum, I've got to say it's the one I've mentioned. It's the silver and pink number. I mean, I'm only going back as far as like the turn of the millennium, but 
that has got to be one of... Don't get me wrong, there's been some horrendous attempts at trying to replicate the bumblebee as well, mm. where we've had just like bright, luminous, see you in the dark, council workers wear it yellow, but that silver and pink, I just, I can't get the image out of my head that it's going to be on a Dale Winton game show. Dale Winton's instead. Now, Gary Doonan via Facebook said that loved the Crystal Palace jersey from early 70s, the one big John Hughes wore. I know exactly which one you're talking about. That is a belter. John Hughes as in? Senior. Ah. Senior. John Hughes and Willie Wallace both signed for Crystal Palace. They had this white jersey and it had like a panel down the middle, I think. Um, and it was the, the, the classic. Loads of clubs just reverted to the initials of the team. So Leeds United had LUFC, Crystal mm-hmm. Palace, CPFC. So I had that text. I think that's the one you're talking about, Gary. If so, that was a cracker. Um, and Nicholas McDade, that pink thing was horrendous. Is he talking about the one that you're referring to? If he's not, he's... Because we had two. Do you know, I actually quite liked the first pink kit. The one that was sort of pink. It was quite black. a... Was a cerise? Was it a cerise pink? The black? I've, I've not got the gel up. Name the player that here. comes to your mind. When did we wear that? We wore Sinclair. That to... Easter Road. Yeah. Scott Sinclair. We also wore it at Rugby Park, I think I remember as well. We wore mm. it quite a few times. Yeah, wasn't a big fan. That was the one that was inspired by the Lisbon ticket, allegedly. Uh, football, CFB, Callum, welcome back. Great to hear from you. New balance kits were hit or miss. I agree with that. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, the 50th anniversary home jersey was a classic. Yeah. Loving the new Adidas collection. I think I am as well. You bought all, all got the kits. All. You got yep. them all. In fact, full kit? <laughs> no, not full kit. Um... In the car as well, I've got the Adidas Originals, the zipper as Have well. You? Love it. Mm. Love it. Love Adidas. Yeah. Nah, the, it's I a nice range. Until out some of these horrors that we've mentioned before. It's a nice range. So, we've been speaking about, keep them coming, keep your comments coming. We've been speaking about horrific football jerseys on the back in Man United's Zebra kit, which I'm sorry will never be a cult classic. And we've also been speaking about Mark Miller, who used to write or still does write about superheroes, and he became a superhero for his local club, Albion Rovers. Uh, Meech67 remembers Armstrong scoring at Rugby Park in the pink kit. Yep, good shout, good shout. Was right behind the goal. Gary Doonan uh, via Facebook, Hibernian 72 Cup Final, one-off, won by the elegant Pat Stanton. What a vision. Hips kits, Mm. do you remember one which was basically like a white sash? Green with a white sash through it? Is it quite a modern one, is it? I think it was maybe late 90s. Mm. And Crystal like, Palace also had a white with, with a sash. It had the sort of... The logo was smack bang in the middle of it. It was like a sort of oval... I can't sort of, remember I can't that. Remember I can't remember. The, the Hibs ones I remember are, you know, the Bokta that George Best wore. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Bokta jersey, which I think was reproduced in the last 10, 20 years. And then there was a, a collection of Hibs strips in the 80s that were brilliant. They were Adidas. Mm-hmm. Uh, quite a few of them. One with the V-neck, Frank Graham Group were, were the sponsors. Maybe P&D Windows were the sponsors. And then a sponsorless season that was won by Murdo McLeod when he went to Hibs with a round neck. Great strips. Here's a question for you. Sponsor or sponsorless? Always sponsorless. I really liked the Motherwell kits from last season mm-hmm. because their main kit was sponsorless because of the Paddy Power involvement. I really like it. In fact, of the three kits Celtic have released this season... Two of them I have are sponsorless. Joseph Byrne, don't mention sash strips, Peru. Well, his point of reference is a wee bit earlier than mine <laughs> because obviously he's talking about a famous or infamous defeat at the hands of Peru. Kevin Graham, did the story not originally appear in the Rebel Inc fanzine which his pal Kev Williamson ran? That was a fanzine I was thinking about, Rebel Inc. And I'm sure it... What was the name of the... Uh, the there was a, an alien reference in there. You know, it was an early story that Orvin Welsh then lent to the children of Albion Rovers. And Kevin goes on to say, I always like the Hibs 92 League Cup winning kit. We've got a signed programme out there Mm -hmm. um, of that game. Reminds me of Mickey Weir. You know, remember Mickey Weir. Hibs had a good side back then. Seriously, Hibs were a strong side. Not to my knowledge, he he got a move down to Luton Town. Mm. He moved down south. He was a wee winger, if I remember right. And I do remember a kind of blonde hair. He had a perm at one stage. But you know it was eighty, so it was acceptable. Gary Doonan, Arsenal seventy-one home top. Charlie George, 
brilliant. But even Charlie George is still the, the long flowing hair. The perms and Great. all that back then. A throwback, brilliant. Um, and again, Callum, football, CFB, some sponsors are part of the classics, Arsenal with JVC. I get that. That's a good point. I get that. Uh, I'm trying to think. There was um, Atletico Madrid were sponsored by um, the Triple X film. Oh, was it? came out at one point. Right. So you know the Atletico Madrid strip, the red and white yeah. stripes. Triple X through the middle of it. Ah, well. I don't know if you've become iconic to relate that with. Well, I don't some know. Of the players. I mean, there's nothing wrong with being influenced or, or um, you know, by the the adult entertainment industry. That that's the only reason we've gone live in it, uh, interactive this season. <laughs> but um, we've also got TDK, TDK, uh, Ajax, Ab Namro was always Ajax as the well. One uh, Crown Paints, Crown Candy, Paints, yep. you know yeah. all that kind of thing. They were so integral to the design. I'd say Celtics is CR Smith. I would agree with that. I would agree with that. Yeah. Definitely. Rangers is McEwen's lager. Yeah, aye, because that wasn't a very good uh, <laughs> lager either. Um, Kevin Graham's reminding us of Crown Paints. All the jerseys was amazing. You, you can remember yellow ones, white, red. The yellow one was probably um, one of my favourite ones. Gary Doon and West Brom away, green, yellow, 78, 79, Cyril Regis, Laurie Cunningham. You, you think of a jersey, you think of a player, don't you? I think is it Air United this season have a green and blue number? Are they not the ones, though, that, that do the... The model has been painted naked. Yes. Brilliant. Why it's not? A great market Why not? Idea. What's wrong with that? This this year they've they've tried to reach out to fans from both sides of uh, Glasgow's divide and done a it's literally half and half, half blue, half green. Green and blue doesn't go. Oh, you see it. Northern I Ireland have done it a few times with a half in fact was it a Harlequin or a half and half, Northern Ireland. The green and the blue, it doesn't work. Another iconic kit that springs to mind is the Ireland kit from mm -hmm. 1990 uh, with Jack Charlton as manager. Yep, an 88. Uh, fantastic. Brilliant, kit. brilliant jerseys. Some of those kits are, you see them being... Going back to what Callum said about the sponsor, Republic of Ireland and Opal. Aye, you Opal. Know, um, because Opal no jersey. many, I mean, no many international teams had a sponsor, but there's Republic of Ireland bouncing a bit with Opal. Pretty much. You know? Um, Brown, we'll come back to any more suggestions because I think Colin wants to also speak about the working classes or football fans being uh, priced out of football, pri priced out of modern football. Yeah. So what you got for us, Colin? And I think, I mean, we're, we're kind of looking at this now as we're rounding up the podcast, but I think this is one for you, you all to kind of have a wee think about and come back to us for maybe next week's show and we'll, we'll, we'll start with that. And it's, do you rem when we're looking at the guys that have contributed today, um, when they were growing up, when they were playing football, mm. you went out, you had an ash park that was free. You got to go on it. You went and kicked the ball about. You put jumpers down. You played football. It, football is and should be a simple game to play. It needs some friends and a ball. Maybe a couple of jumpers that you take home and your mum would have a go at you because you've got them dirty. But it's a ball and it's it's the simplest sport that's out there. Nowadays, we're looking at 3G, 4G surfaces that are out there. Pretty much every school in Scotland is now attached to a 3G or a 4G surface. And that's great for kids when they're in school because they've got access to that. But when I'm looking at people that are coming through, youth teams, mm. I mean, in Inverclyde, you've got East End United and you've got St Andrews who are two of the most well-recognised youth development systems in Scotland, First Touch as well, who produced team A players for Celtic and Rangers, I found out this week that to hire a 3G surface for under the age of 18, for two hours, cost nearly £90. Mm. £90. Now, see over this last couple of months when the pandemic was out there, these parks weren't getting maintained. So... There were stories out in the press where um, people were using the, the entrances that are there for um, to get in and out and were socialising there, were having gatherings that they probably shouldn't have. But these dogging. parks... These parks Betty don't, dogging. <laughs> I don't know if you were there or not, but um, these parks don't have bins. So, of course, they're going to get dirty. People are there from... I don't know, 10 o'clock in the morning to 6 o'clock at night playing football. 
They're going to nip to the shop. They're going to come back with a packet of crisps and a bottle of juice. I have bottle of bucky. Well, depending on their age, if they can get somebody to go in for them, mm. please, sir. <laughs> but we, we've spent the money on these parks. Mm. They're not cheap. No, they're not. And what are we? We're talking about we can't bring through youth players because we're pricing. People out of actually playing on them. I play a seven a sides. I organise a seven a sides once a week, and for the last five years, the prices went up and up and up and up. And you're asking why, and they say it's to do with inflation, not to do with the fact that they maintain the parks, which they don't. We play with we play with nets with holes in them. Mm. We play with with um, goalposts that sometimes fall apart. Yeah. If we're going to spend the money on these surfaces because they're all weather and teams can use them, we have to make them affordable and available to people. Otherwise, there's going to be a lost generation. No wonder kids want to sit in and play an Xbox because they're not getting people coming out and shouting at them because the ball goes over the fence. They're not going to uh, have people shouting at them because there's cars parked nearby. Mm -hmm. There is a generation that which we say is lost and the reason we've lost them is because they don't have five and six pounds a day to go and play on the surfaces which we have provided for them. We've had a, a lot of people who are involved in youth football on this podcast over the last several months, Colin. And we, we take a wee bit from the likes of John Calhoun, for example. We take some from Brian McClare, people who have been involved at various levels. Uh, looking at the development of young players coming through in Scotland, where it goes wrong, why we're not developing an international team, which is the pinnacle of that development, you know, going up to the point where we're not producing teams who are good enough to uh, qualify for the finals in major tournaments. And the big issue, again, going back to the, the, the many years and the millions of pounds that was pumped into this, um, yeah, you know, Henry McLeish's paper in relation to how to solve this back then, uh, the big the big uh, development in, in pro youth and all this kind of thing has focused it all into that. So you get into organised football. You get into organised football at a young age. What about the, the football that isn't organised? What about the guys who might not show promise and be attached to a certain club who are at that age aren't confident enough to go and play for a club or even want to play for a club? They just want to play with their pals. And a lot of the time, these guys develop as street footballers. Yeah. Uh, that's just a term, but street footballers in our day were actually street fo footballers, but at, in a, an environment which is not competitive, it's not organised, and doesn't cost you the earth. Street football doesn't exist anymore. No. It doesn't exist anymore. And it's through... It, 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 and part of it's our own fault. Well, it is. I mean, but, remember the, the point I made about Craig Brown and wanting to, to build 50 facilities all around Scotland to allow the youth to go and play. That idea wasn't about then, you know, tying them all up in red tape and ensuring that that pro youth team uses that and this mm -hmm. pro youth team uses this and all that kind of thing. This was a, a, a predecessor to pro youth and it was looking at giving the kids the facilities. I can't credit the person because I don't remember um, who they are, but they released a book and it was basically goals from all around the world. And what I mean by goals is it was where mm -hmm. they'd like painted on a wall in Liverpool yeah, yeah things yep. like that mm -hmm. the most unique goals in the world there's like pitches from up in the highlands and in the islands where the pitch is literally on like a 35 degree slant and things like that but all I see round about and I don't know if every area is like this people that are watching and listening can can give their say as well no ball games mm -hmm. refused entry where do we where do we send the kids to play? We're talking about we can't get them out of the house, but when we do get them out of the house, where can they go? Every pitch that's out there nowadays is a three or four G pitch. Mm -hmm. You're lucky to find parks where there's grass that's maintained by councils. So when the kids then put their balls down, there's there's things like duck sheet lying about because it's not maintained. You don't want your kids playing in that. Just for anybody who's uh, listening outside of your region, what's dog shite? <laughs> dog feces. <laughs> yeah. No, you're absolutely right. And it is something we could dig in a lot deeper. And we probably will on the next episode as well, Colin. Can I go back to some of the comments coming through? Fire away. Uh, no one was asking what dog shite is, but thanks for clearing that up. <laughs> Not literally. Uh, Joseph Burn 
This isn't a Celtic show. Uh, any Rangers strip drenched in tears has got to be a winner. We'll see how the season goes, Joseph. Um, Gary Doonan, San Etienne, 78, Dominique Rochow. Is that how you pronounce that, Gary? Let me know. Uh, Rochiel. Um, San Etienne, even just the name, minted some of the 70s and 80s jerseys. Absolutely class. I even remember like, people coming into school with film Marseille trackies and things like that. Mm. European football's definitely produced some crackers. Did your school ever do that kind of French exchange thing? I'm being serious because that's all you saw with the French students coming to the school was the Marseille stuff, you know. And it was very stylish back then. Uh, but obviously Bernard Tappy put paid to that. Be uh, Celtic Rab, Lambert at Dortmund. That was a classic strip. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Commodore. Just about any jersey with Commodore on it. I think the the Dortmund one, was it not Continental? I could be wrong. Sure. But the Commodore one, I'm thinking Bayern Munich and Chelsea mm -hmm. had the Commodore and it was brilliant. Where's that from now, Commodore? The Commodore Amiga jerseys. Uh, Nicholas McDade loved the Barcelona away kit from the 1990s. Kappa sponsor on the sleeve. Oh yeah, I remember that. The only Hadji worth watching. That was where they had the, the Kappa all the way down the sleeves. That oh, was minted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But back then, Kappa was one of these brands. We were speaking about it yesterday, actually. There was a very there was various brands like Ineri uh, did a lot of the Italian strips and you had Kappa and Kelma like and all, all, all these classic brands that used to do football strips uh, but then Kappa became you know it was just like Little Britain Kappa and it became the laughing stock that used to be a really cool brand like there's quite a few but, but it's like that that's made a comeback over the last few years uh, companies like Alessi mm. now when I was going through school if you had Alessi trainers it was like wearing Adidas two stripes it wasn't <laughs> worth wearing but now people are paying 60 70 pounds for a t-shirt like that mm -hmm. so these, these these companies might make a comeback someday. So you're talking about going to school. We wore SPX and Troop and things like that. No, naff, naff. No, Never sorry, heard. point of reference, mate. Gary Doonan, 1977, Glasgow Select and Joe Bloggs. Uh, the Glasgow Select Jubilee Strip. Green, blue, yellow, white, red, black and white, all colours of Glasgow teams, worn by Kenny Douglish. I've seen a picture of that. It is horrific. I know you see it. Oh, it's terrible. Terrible jersey. Uh, they try to obviously encapsulate all the Glasgow sides on one jersey. Mm. Shocking. I think it was Umbro. Kevin Graham, Scotland's 96 tartan number was horrendous. Disagree. I loved I really it. Liked it. I liked that. But the 1986 World Cup number was glorious. 96, I just see Colin Hendry, 86 as Gordon Strachan. Ah, but the shorts were shocking. See the, Did the band in the shorts? So... And Strachan couldn't Archibald get over the sponsor. Was 82? Archibald. Was it Archibald? Archibald, Archibald Strachan. No, not Archibald Strachan. No, I'm saying Gordon Strachan. Aye. You're talking Stevie Archibald. I was talking Stevie Archibald. What goal? It's not Stevie Archibald, is it? <laughs> don't know what goal you're talking about. The goal against <laughs> the Netherlands. Oh, I, uh, come on. Archie Gemmel. Archie Gemmel, sorry. The famous train spotting goal. 82? 86? 78. Is it, is it as early as that? Yeah, he took he took, he took on Vim Janssen as part of his Maisie run. That's the kit that they actually they've, they've re-released. You know, the... Is it, I think it's score gold that does uh, the retro kits. Nice jersey. That is a really nice kit. Very nice. Simple. But again, worn by, uh, you know, proper talented legends mm. that played for Scotland. But that was Archie Gemmel, 1978. I've never great. felt that good since Archie Gemmel, Archie Gemmel scored against Holland in 1978. The famous line. Uh, Gary Doonan, every academy should have an ash pitch and a load of walls. That's where you really develop a touch and control. Yeah, you did. You played off a wall. You played Barry uh, with, with a set of goals. You did keep you up, he's famously. Some people could do more than others. And um, Brian H. Hi, guys. Do you think Duffy will score at the weekend or will he be on the bench? It's a good question. It's a good question. We're playing away. I say we. Celtic are playing away to Ross County. Do we play at three at the back? When I can't see uh, Ayer or Julien being dropped for that game. When we did the... Um Celtic State of Mind Daily Bulletin earlier on I did kind of write down what I thought my, my team would be and I would have Duffy in it um, mm -hmm. I Alongside see why, I don't see why not Alongside who? Iron Julian so I, Back just, three Yeah I would just I'll throw it out there Barkas Duffy Iron Julian Forrest and Cham McGregor Taylor Turnbull Eddie and Ayeti No Brown No Brown Okay Bold That was bold Kevin Graham My nephew is 40 Shows you how old Kevin is mm -hmm quid a month to play football and he is only six 40 quid a month and he's six it's ridiculous it's a lot of money 
I mean, a lot of money. These training camps as well that go around towns. Celtic used to do one um, in Port Glasgow where I think he got either, it was a morning session or an afternoon session at St Stephen's High School and you got maybe a training top that said Celtic on it and something like that. Mm. But even back then, and I'm talking maybe eight, nine years ago, mm-hmm. that was like 35 quid. Aye. I mean, it's yeah. horrific. And see, when you're buying, a, like for example, a New Balance strip, you buy it. Or cast stories probably a better example. Mm. Uh, you're spending what you what would probably be expensive for a t-shirt. Let's say a fifty-five pound t-shirt. Is that expensive? Maybe I think it probably is. Um, and then you buy that. You buy the the football replica top, and the quality is dreadful mm-hmm. for the, for the price. You know, um, and there's more coming through. Chomsky boy, try to help me out with the pronunciation. Uh, let's try again. Rochi Tau, Rochi Tau, Rochi Tau. Okay, we'll go with that. And Sean South, uh, interesting name, Sean. Southampton versus Man United. It was 3 nothing at half time, 3 1 at full time. So the change of kit helped them. Aye, 3 0. They were down 3 0. I remember it. Um, and Brian also loved the Celta Vigo shirt back in the Seville run. That was a particularly. Uh, Rochato. Rochato. Rochatoi. Who knows? I'm going to have to YouTube that. You've got a week to learn that. Ah, I'm going to have to uh, learn it. So that was Saturn ATN. Listen, I've really enjoyed that because it was um, basically looking at the world of football. And we've called this new podcast The Football Insomniac because hopefully it doesn't send you to sleep. And uh, we're going to be pulling some left field, I was going to say left wing, maybe, left field subjects in the world of football and chatting about it. This week we spoke about Mark Miller being a superhero for Albion Rovers. You and I are going to buy uh, virtual season tickets for Clifton Hill. Man United Zebra away kit and our, the working class has been priced out of football. We'll return to that one. Thanks everybody for getting involved. We'll keep it coming once a week. And thank you to Colin Watt for being the, the first guest and the only guest so far on the Football Insomniac.